Explaining Kierkegaard was presented by Dr. Jack Crabtree at a Saturday conference entitled Kierkegaard's Coffee House on April 14, 2007. The copyright for this recording is held by Gutenberg College, Inc., 2007. Gutenberg College is a nonprofit organization, and contributions may be made at www.gutenberg.edu. This material may be copied and distributed in whole for non-commercial and educational purposes, subject to the inclusion of this introduction. All other rights reserved. I'm thinking that more profit will come from question and answers than from me talking, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blitz through here and hope that this can just be provocative and, and provoke some questions. My, my initial disclaimer is that I don't pretend to really to have any expertise in Kierkegaard. There are many of our students at Gutenberg who have read more and have mastered Kierkegaard more than I have, and they would be better, uh, better resources for you than I would be on Kierkegaard. If I have any expertise at all, my expertise is in the New Testament. So I, my, the perspective I bring to this is not to be a resource so that you can have an authority on Kierkegaard speaking to you, but someone who I think has some perspective to be able to um, ask the question and answer the question, is Kierkegaard a Christian? <laughs> I mean, is he talking about what the New Testament is talking about? And I, I think that's what I can bring to it. Um, let me give you a little bit of background and why I didn't read Kierkegaard for about 15 years of my life. I was first, I, I was raised in a, um, a cultural Christian environment, a church, uh, kind of a standard main line, you might even call it fundamentalistic, although I wouldn't even dignify it with that sometimes, but um, a, a typical American conservative Bible-believing church with all the culture and all the cultural trappings that go with that. And part of that was, I didn't know it at the time, but part of that was is a very strong anti-intellectual current in that culture. I went, away, I went away to Stanford University to go to college, which was a pretty heady environment, a pretty intellectual environment. And... Uh, I went away swearing that I was going to keep the faith no matter what because there was only one thing I was convinced of is that Jesus had something true about him that I needed to hang on to. But I was just going to hang on to that. Now, as it turns out, I don't think if it hadn't been for the grace of God to bring into my life some very thoughtful and uh, literate and educated Christians who helped me work through a lot of the issues. If it hadn't been for that, I don't think I could have kept my own vow uh, because um, there's something about being made in the image of God and having a mind that God expects me to use that also resonated with me. I, I believed that I needed to have a thoughtful faith and I, I wasn't in of myself already equipped to, uh, to be able to meet the challenges of a secular university. But one of the people I was introduced to for the first time in college was Kierkegaard. And this was back in the 60s, and Kierkegaard was actually being very widely read uh, by a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds back in the 60s. I did my part to read some Kierkegaard and try to appreciate him or critique him or whatever. And um, a combination of, two, of three things, I think, uh, made me pass a negative judgment on Kierkegaard and basically just reject him, put him on the shelf such that I didn't, didn't even look at him again for 15 years. One was just my own impulse as a knee-jerk fundamentalist Christian. Um, fundamentalism doesn't have the categories of true and false. They have the categories of safe and unsafe. There are people that are safe to read and there are other people that are unsafe to read and you stay away from them. You don't want to be contaminated by them. You don't want them to influence you. And that was very much, I think, the mindset that I had absorbed from my culture. Um, and they're all, Kierkegaard just doesn't sound Christian, especially if you don't read the right works of Kierkegaard, especially if you're reading uh, his more philosophical works. He doesn't sound like a fundamentalist. And since he didn't sound like a fundamentalist, he didn't sound safe. And since he didn't sound safe, I wasn't going to be reading him. So part of that was just personal. The other part of that is that Francis Schaeffer was coming on the scene about that time. And Schaeffer's treatment of Kierkegaard is kind of mixed. You know, Schaeffer gives you a, a sentence or two saying, I'm not, I'm not saying he wasn't a Christian. He may very well have been a Christian. Uh, but... Um, 
he was instrumental in driving this wedge between the upper story and the lower story, if you're familiar with his thought at all. That Kierkegaard was one of the, one of the people who, who uh, made that division between upper and story in, Western, in the history of Western thought all the more, uh, the gap all the, the wider. Now, frankly, I think Schaefer's not altogether wrong about that because Kierkegaard, it's one thing to talk about um, Kierkegaard as a person and what he was saying and what he was contributing and what his project was and what he was trying to accomplish. That's one thing. His impact on intellectual history is an entirely different question. And unfortunately, what happened is Kierkegaard got appropriated by people who were not Christians. And the most notable, of course, is Sartre, I think. And, and that comes to the third reason I put uh, Kierkegaard on the shelf. Everything that, that I learned in academia about Kierkegaard was Kierkegaard read through the secular lenses of the 1960s, and everybody thought Kierkegaard was John Paul Sartre. And so you, you tended to read Kierkegaard and interpret his language, his uh, his arguments, and so on, as if he were making the as if he were promoting the same kind of perspectives and the same kind of worldview that, of French existentialism. So I just decided, as someone who was interested in Christianity and as someone who was trying to come to terms with the Bible and what it taught and the truth in the Bible, I had other and better things to do than to read Kierkegaard because he wasn't going to contribute to my project all that much. Fifteen years later, uh, for reasons I won't get into, I go back to graduate school. And I'm in the philosophy department. I'm getting a PhD in philosophy. And in order to afford it, I'm a graduate teaching fellow in a class on existentialism. Uh, I just got assigned that. And you don't do a class on existentialism without doing a little bit of Kierkegaard, so we are assigned some reading in Kierkegaard. Well, let, me, let me back up. Remember, this is 15 years later. In the meantime, I have, I have been devoting myself primarily to the New Testament. And that, like I say, that's what I would consider my expertise. I was really trying to come to terms with what is this gospel that the apostles and Jesus are talking about, that the New Testament is talking about here? What is this gospel? And I've made paradigm shift after paradigm shift after paradigm shift in the course of those 15 years in coming to terms with the New Testament and what, it, what it's talking about. So the me who had read Kierkegaard as an undergraduate was a very, very different me 15 years later. Um, the, only thing that was, the only thing that remained the same was the name. I was a Christian, but there wasn't anything about my Christianity 15 years later that resembled the, fifth, the Christianity of 15 years before when I was first trying to read Kierkegaard. So I get ready for my discussion group by reading the assigned reading in Kierkegaard, and I just my, my jaw drops. Kierkegaard, where have you been all my life? <laughs> I mean, just everything that I had been discovering, everything that I had been learning, I, said, I, I realized this, this dude knew it centuries before I did. I mean, this is just wonderful stuff. And so I, I, I would just, I found a new friend in Kierkegaard, and so from then on, I have, I have learned to appreciate that mostly what I learned, learned is that Kierkegaard is getting his material from the New Testament, basically. He's a very penetrating thinker, a very incisive thinker, a profound thinker, a keen thinker, but his material is not his own. He's a student of the New Testament, and he's absorbing what this New Testament Christianity is all about and attempting to reframe that and rephrase it and articulate that in a fresh way to his particular generation. So... Um, so, I started reading Kierkegaard again, but I, that's why I hadn't read him for 15 years. So let's begin by talking about what, what I think the mistakes were that led to me so getting him so wrong the first time I read him. And I have two, two different cracks at that. One way, the fundament, fundamental mistake I made in my first reading of Kierkegaard, it could be put this way. As a philosopher, as a philosophy student as a philosophy student who is keenly interested in epistemology, who is keenly interested in understanding whether or not, how, how we know whether our beliefs are warranted and so on, I just assumed that that's what Kierkegaard was talking about. So 
and, and that was wrong. The last thing Kierkegaard is actually interested in is the epistemology of religious belief. That's the last thing he's interested in. Rather, Kierkegaard's project is to explore the spiritual realities and the dynamics of the Christian faith. He's engaged in articulating a theory of Christian spirituality, of Christian faith, not a theory of knowledge. Now, the two overlap a little bit, that's true, and and Kierkegaard is keenly aware of the overlap, but it's not the rationality of belief that interests him, it's the existentiality of belief that interests him, and I'll define that in a second. But it, it's not an issue of whether or not the belief is rational. It's an issue of whether or not we're going to do it. Are we going to make the commitment? Are we going to actually embrace it? Are we actually going to believe? And what is it that makes the difference between why one person does believe and another person does not? The rationality of belief he takes for granted, I would argue. And that was so incredibly confusing to me because you read all kinds of sentences in Kierkegaard that throw you. Truth is subjectivity. Well, you can imagine the fundamentalist me who, well, fundamentalist me, want to be intellectual me, um, confronting a, f- a phrase like truth is subjectivity and, and accepting that. No, truth is objective. It's the objective truth. It's the historical truth. We really believe that Jesus really existed and these things really happened and that's the foundation and ground of our faith. And if that's not the foundation and ground of our faith, then we're some kind of liberal neo-Orthodox Christian, but we're not real Christians. I mean, that's how I responded. But it's because I wasn't understanding his project that I I didn't understand that when he says truth is subjectivity, he's not denying the objective reality of of God and Jesus and everything that Jesus taught. He's not denying that at all. He's taking that for granted. But what he's trying to say is, so? So what if Christianity is objectively true and you don't believe it? It doesn't doesn't do you any good if you don't believe it. So how do you get from not believing it to believing it? That's That's the interesting question. That's the crucial question. Another way of articulating the the mistake I made, I think, could be looked at this way. Kierkegaard is not asking, is Christianity objectively true? As I've just said, he's taking it for granted that it's objectively true. Or Kierkegaard is not asking, is one rationally justified in believing in Christianity? He would assume that, of course, you are. He's not asking, is there objective evidence for the truth of Christianity? He would assume that there is, sure. He's not asking, does it matter whether there is objective evidence for the truth of Christianity? I would argue that his answer would be, well, yes, it matters. He would assume so. How can you embrace something as true if you have no reason to think it's true? Of course, that's just commonsensical. That's just rational. That makes sense. And I think Kierkegaard is not not, um, defying common sense in his writings. He's presuming that we would be commonsensical enough to, to not dare think that you would embrace something that's irrational. Of course you wouldn't do that. Well, that wasn't my first reading. I believed he was a fideist, that, you, that your belief in Christianity was its own justification, and that the, irra- that the faith was actually objectively irrational, and that was the virtue of it. Well, um, I didn't much like that, nor should I have liked that, nor I think would Kierkegaard much like that. That's not his perspective. Rather, what Kierkegaard is asking is, who is the person who has authentic faith? Who is it who has authentic faith? Who is the person who embraces the truth of Christianity in such a way that he will be saved? What does true, authentic, saving faith look like? Remember the the background that David laid out for you. He's in a society where there are, as to use his numbers, I don't know if they're hyperbole or not, there are millions of Christians in in Denmark. His question is, of these millions of Christians in Denmark, who's going to receive eternal life? Who's going to be saved? In other words, whose faith is genuine and authentic faith? That's his project, is to answer that set of questions. 
Okay, keeping that in mind, let me just define some terms. Kierkegaard is considered in, philosoph- in the history of philosophy the father of existentialism, but let me define existentialism. I got this from my professor at University of Oregon, and I, this was very helpful to me. It's a very simple distinction you need to make. Most isms in philosophy are defining a worldview, a set of beliefs, a school of thought that share a common a common take on reality in one way or the other. And so rationalism, empiricism, uh, subjectivism, they have a particular distinctive doctrine or set of doctrines that define them. That's not the case with existentialism. Existentialists who hold widely different beliefs about reality, and yet they are all existentialists. So you have a Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard on the one hand who are Christian believers that you would want to identify as existentialism, and they embrace a Christian worldview based on Christian Judeo-Christian theism. On the other hand, you have a Sartre or Camus who embrace a worldview based on atheism, and in Sartre's case, his own kind of brand of nihilism. Nietzsche probably shouldn't even be classed as an existentialist, although a lot of people do. He's a materialist who embraces a worldview based on his own idiosyncratic synthesis of Darwinism and Stoicism. Well, there's nothing Christian about a Nietzsche. There's nothing Christian about Sartre, and yet they are still existentialist. Well, what makes an existentialist an existentialist? Why would you categorize them together? Not because they have shared belief systems, but because they have a shared perspective on two or three things here. One, they have a shared perspective on the nature of the philosophical task. From their perspective, the nature of the philosophical task is to understand human existence. In contrast to Plato, for example, or even more importantly, Plotinus, the beginning, the one who started Neoplatonism, where the, the task of philosophy is to engage in these grand philosophical speculations. I mean, in one way, both the weakness of Greek philosophy and the genius of Greek philosophy and that is that the Greek culture, the Greek intellectual culture, decided there is no question that I can't answer. And, and they're quite able and willing to let their minds go and out of their own imaginations uh, come up with some rationalization of their answer to unanswerable questions. Didn't make any difference that no human being in his right mind would ever think he knew the answer to that question. The Greeks came up with it anyway. Well, there's another, the- there's another strand of philosophy that looks at that and says, no, nah, I, I don't think you know what you're talking about. I mean, you're just speculating. You're just making this stuff up. You're just blowing smoke. But there, but there are some things that we can explore and examine and dialogue about and have a conversation about and maybe come to some answers about, and that's the nature of our own existence. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? And so on. Existentialists are those people who narrow the focus of their philosophical investigation to the set of questions that concern the nature of human existence itself. Which is to say, a, a part of their perspective is that those are the questions that are most, most worth addressing. Those are the important questions. So those are questions concerning the nature of human existence, but it's not just human existence in the abstract. It's concerning the nature of individual human existence, even more specifically, my individual human existence, Coming, addressing the questions that concern who I am. Who am I? How am I to exist? In what should I invest my existence? That kind of question. Any question that gets at the nature of my own individual particular existence in this world and how I ought to live then you would, you would find, and this is the closest thing that existentialists get to a shared belief system, you would have a minimal set of foundational assumptions that, that all existentialists would share. One is um, that the human individual is self-defining. The human individual, by the choices that he makes in life, is defining his existence. Second one, that is correlated with that, the human individual is free with respect to those self-defining choices, or at least 
ought to be free and ought to operate in their freedom. It, you know, bad faith for Sartre is having someone else tell you how to live. Society, culture, your parents, your professor, or someone else dictate to you what you should be committed to. That's what he calls bad faith. To be an authentic human individual, I need to take responsibility for what I'm going to commit to in my life and therefore how I'm going to define my own personal existence. And I think that's my next point. The human individual is responsible for the self-defining choices he makes. And then finally, uh, the human individual cannot and must not try to shift responsibility for his self-defining choices onto someone else and remove it from himself. Okay, that, those are the shared, that's the shared perspective that defines this loosely knit group of philosophers and thinkers that we call existentialists. What was striking to me when the professor laid out this perspective on existentialism is it's interesting because I don't think there would be such, an ex, uh, such a thing as existentialism if it weren't for Christianity, or at least the Judeo-Christian tradition. Who were the first existentialists? The Hebrew prophets were the first existentialists calling Israel to take responsibility for their relationship to their God, for their commitment to their God. Are you going to take that commitment seriously or you're not going to take that commitment seriously? Are you going to live like your neighbors or are you going to take responsibility for yourself and do right by your relationship to God in spite of the fact that, that other people are pressuring you not to? then certainly when you get to Jesus and the apostles, they are thoroughgoing existentialists by this definition. There's no question about that. Uh, The only pagan existentialist of old would be Socrates. Socrates was clearly an existentialist and had a huge impact on his culture. And I think, frankly, my own private opinion is he was a prophet to the Greeks, but that's another day. Okay, with that in mind then, let's define some terms. So if we're going to understand existentialism, what do they mean by existence? By existence, existentialism comes from the word existence. Existential is other pertaining to existence, and existentialism is that, um, that style of doing philosophy that has to do with that which is other pertaining to existence. So the key term here is existence. What do they mean by that? They mean the existence of a particular individual human being, not existence in the abstract, not humanity in the abstract, but my own concrete individual particular existence. That's existence. Existential is other pertaining to that. So what's the existential question? The existential question is, how will I, as a particular concrete individual, define my own particular individual existence? Who will I be? What, um, yeah, who will I be? That's the existential question. For Kierkegaard, the question of faith just is a particular form of the existential question. In fact, it is the ultimate existential question for Kierkegaard. (coughs) Who will I be, name and in particular, will I decide to be a human being who defines his life and choices by the truth of Christianity? Or not, and that is, he's famous for his dichotomy either or. He has a whole work called Either Or, and that 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 dichotomy comes up throughout his writing. Either we will or we won't, and it's pretty much up to me. Nobody can make me become a Christian. Nobody can make me define myself by the truth of Christianity. That's a lonely individual decision that I'm stuck with. I and I alone must face into the question. Will you define your life and existence by the truth of what Jesus came and taught? What is an existential crisis? An existential crisis is a critical event in our lives that raises the question, who do you want to be? By what do you want your existence to be defined? So not just any crisis in my life is an existential crisis. Some crises in my life are just hard times. It's just suffering, it's just tribulation, it's just trial, and so on. But every now and then, a crisis comes into my life that actually raises the question in a live way such that I could go either or. 
you know, I, I could go this way or I could go the other way in terms of what I want my life to be defined by. You know, do I want it to be defined by Christianity or not? Do I want to live my life in the light of the truth of Christianity or do I want to shine it on? I, that's an existential crisis when I face that question. And the existential decision, of course, then is making a decision that is tantamount to deciding that you want your existence to be defined by something. An existential commitment is a commitment that, that defines the very meaning and definition of my own individual per, particular concrete existence. Not every commitment is an existential commitment. I can make a commitment to, to a job without it being an existential commitment. I can make a commitment to a group of people without it being an existential commitment. I'm just being responsible. I'm just making a promise. I'm just making a commitment. But if the commitment that I make is, a, is on such an order that it defines the very nature of my personal existence, then it's an existential commitment. Okay. With that in the background, then, let me look at what I think are three of the most important questions that Kierkegaard is addressing in his, throughout his works. And remember, I'm not a Kierkegaard scholar. These are just the ones that have struck me and have impacted me profoundly. The first one, if a person is a Christian who believes that Christianity is true, do they then have what the Bible calls faith? And a lot of his writing, some of, the re- some of your reading today, dealt with this question. Is it enough to believe that Christianity is true um, to say that you have faith? And his answer is clearly no, not necessarily. And his whole perspective, he, he gets at this in a number of different ways, but if faith is as easy as that, if faith is, is, is as easy as just simply believing that Christianity is true and Jesus is the Christ and the various claims that Christians make, if it's just saying that you think those things are true, then how is it that what Jesus taught, how is that true? Jesus taught that the way to eternal life is exceedingly narrow and few pass that way. And Kierkegaard has some, has some very, very humorous passages about all those millions of Christians in Denmark trying to crowd through the narrow, <laughs> the narrow way. It's a very funny image. But, but there's a very profound point behind that is that we obviously have misunderstood what faith is if we think that this way that is exceedingly narrow that few are passing down, we are passing the judgment that all, all million of us are in, that all of us have got it made. And he thinks there's something funky about that, that view of faith. He argues that true saving faith must be a faith that believes in Jesus from the standpoint of contemporaneity. And you, you looked at that in, the, in your reading for today. Um, I, I'm not altogether sure I understand fully what he means by that. Uh, I, I'm inclined to think that there's two sides of that and that, it, that he means two things by it at different places in his writings. On the one hand, he means that in order to be a true Christian... It's not, um, we don't embrace the Jesus of 2,000 years of history, the triumphant Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Lord of his glorious and wealthy church, the Lord of millions and millions of people who sing praises to his name. His point is, there's so much glory in that Jesus, who wouldn't believe in that Jesus? Who wouldn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah? But the true believer is the one who transports himself back and puts himself in the shoes of the original disciples. Who is the Jesus that they had to profess is the Christ? A poor, simple, um, Galilean, sorry, Galilean peasant who had nothing in particular to recommend himself um, outwardly. and who was crucified on the cross by the Romans, was mocked by them, was held in contempt by most of the nation, who, who was an utter failure in his life with all of his proclaiming the kingdom of God. It appeared to come to an abrupt end as the, Roman, as the powerful Romans stepped in and just crushed it and put an end to that. And they were being asked to confess that Jesus as Lord, 
and as king of kings, as the son of God, as the Messiah. And what Kierkegaard is saying is, until I go back and face the question that they faced and answer the question that the way they answered it, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, until I say that of the Jesus that they, that they were speaking of, then I don't have true faith. I think in some context, that's what he means by the standpoint of contemporaneity, being contemporaneous with the Christ that they were contemporaneous with, who, um, um, who, who delivered his timeless message about God and mankind to them at that, at that time. But in the reading that, you, that we had today, he, he seems to be taking it in a somewhat different direction. And that tends to be more that we have to, we have to understand Jesus as being contemporaneous with me. I have to bring Jesus, who really is timeless, whose message is timeless, whose message is in another kind of history that, that doesn't evolve and develop and morph and change and transform itself over time, but it's just always the same, confronting every human being throughout all time, no matter what culture they're in, no matter what language they speak, no matter who they are, there is still a Jesus and his message that confronts them and raises the existential questions and creates the existential crisis. What are you going to do with me? And it's bringing that Christ forward into my time and my situation confronting me now with, are you in your situation, Jack, going to believe this truth, believe this teaching, believe this message? And that and only that is true faith. And I think what he has in mind is in part Hegel. David mentioned the, the Hegel as the backdrop to this. Because whether he gets Hegel right or not is another question, but he's not dealing with Hegel directly, I don't think. He's dealing with the way Hegel, Hegelian thought had had an impact on the Christian church in Denmark in his day. And as best I would understand how Kierkegaard sees that, is that Hegel had given support for this kind of triumphalism in the church. I mean, Hegel, one of the things that Hegel says is, you've got this evolution of religion throughout time, and um, the apex of that developmental evolutionary process in religion was Christianity. Christianity is the highest form of religion, and Christianity in Germany is the highest form of Christianity. I mean, that may not be true, but that's, that's certainly within the spirit of Hegel. Um, and, and Luther's looking at that triumphalism in Hegel as that got embraced by the church in Denmark, and, and he's saying, well, <laughs> if this is the apex of the evolution of rationality and, and religious thought, who wouldn't embrace it? Of course. That's a no-brainer. But that's not, that's, not the, that's not the Christianity that we're being called upon to embrace in order to be rightly related to God. The Christianity that we're being asked to embrace is the Christianity that the disciples of Jesus embraced, not the disciples of Hegel have embraced. And, and Hegel's Christianity was all about history and the, the, Jesus, the Jesus who the Christianity that evolved over time in history. And in that regard, uh, Kierkegaard is stepping outside of history and saying, no, the faith that we are to embrace is very unhistorical. It's very contrary to the historical. Uh, Jesus has always spoken and, and raised the same question constantly, absolutely, without qualification, without change, without transformation to every human being who's always lived throughout all time. And it's the same question that he confronts them with. It doesn't change. Okay, the second important question that Kierkegaard addresses is, can a person come to saving faith by being convinced of the truth of Christianity through objective evidence? And Kierkegaard's answer is no, not at all. Now, just on the side... This was really a stumbling block to me the first time I read Kierkegaard. I mean, because the other, you know, the other books I was reading is Evidence That Demands a Verdict and all kinds of apologetic books and all kinds of arguments and reasons for why Christianity is true. And here Kierkegaard is coming along and saying, no, it's not the evidence. You know? And I, I thought what he was saying is not only is it not the evidence, but there is no evidence, 
Christianity is irrational, Christianity is absurd, Christianity doesn't really make any sense. There's no reason anyone in their right mind would believe Christianity, ah, but the virtue is that you believe it anyway. Well, if, if you can put yourself in my shoes and hear that from where I was coming from, why would I listen to that? But what he's saying is profoundly true. What he's saying is not that there is no objective evidence, but what he's saying is there's no objective evidence that has ever led someone to become a Christian. Let me, let me illustrate it with his famous leap of faith. In his uh, concluding unscientific postscript, he has a passage where he talks about the German philosopher Lessing. Lessing was an agnostic, atheist philosopher in Germany who at one point in conversation or dialogue with, a, with another philosopher had argued that I would love to be a Christian. You know, I, I would love to have faith. I don't have any problem with having faith. It, it's a wonderful thing that all you nice Christians are nice Christians. And I would love to make a choice to be a Christian myself. But you see, I got this problem because as I look at the evidence for Christianity and evidence for the truth of Christianity, I come up to this point where Christianity is on the other side of a chasm. I'm sitting here on, on, on this side of the ditch, the chasm. Christianity is on the other side of the chasm. And there's no objective evidence to pave the way, to pave the, the path over the chasm for me. So the only way I could become a Christian is by taking this blind leap to the other side of the chasm. And he says, that implies, that's nice that you have done that, who have done that, but I'm, I'm too rational, you know, I'm too intellectually responsible, I have too much in, intellectual integrity to do that myself, so here I am stuck on this side of the ditch. Well, that, that's Lessing's ditch. Um, Kierkegaard responds to Lessing in, in a typically kind of ironic, sarcastic, smart alecky kind of way, by saying, you know, Lessing is right. He's, I mean, he's interacting with the philosopher who tried to argue with him and tried to argue, but there was objective evidence for Christianity. And, and Kierkegaard basically, as a way of saying, you're approaching this the wrong way, he says, no, Lessing's right. This other dude, I don't remember his name, this other dude's wrong. Lessing is right. There is this ditch, and it, and it takes a leap uh, to, to get to faith. But what Kierkegaard was getting at is there is a ditch, but Lessing has misunderstood the nature of the gap. Lessing has thought that the only thing that, the, the only thing that would be required in order to make him a Christian is to, to get dump trucks full of evidence to fill in the chasm and bring it up to level so he can walk across on a level ground. He thinks lack of evidence is all that is the problem. But Kierkegaard says, the problem is not a lack of evidence. The problem is a lack of desire. Uh, Kierkegaard talk, speaks often of passion. And what he's getting at, this, this is the really at the heart of Kierkegaard's thought, is that, and this is so true to the New Testament, as I, as I understand the New Testament better, there's really two important aspects to faith. There's the intellectual and the rational aspect of faith, which is very real. Faith wouldn't be faith. Uh, without the intellectual and rational aspect of faith. But there's also a volitional or passional aspect of faith. Belief, most beliefs, we don't notice this with respect to most beliefs, but nobody can make you believe something you don't want to believe. Now, mostly we don't see that because mostly we don't see a gap between what I want to believe and what my reason tells me is true. You know, do I believe two plus two is four? Yeah. Do I want to believe it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> At least it's not causing many problems to believe that. The only time you really begin to see the split between what my head tells me is true and what I want to believe is when a sinner who by, very, by his very nature is sort of has animosity toward God and the things of God is brought too close to God. And your mind tells you God is there and you owe him gratitude and you owe him obedience and your service and so on. But the, the sinful antagonism within you says, but I don't want to go there. I don't want to bow my knee to no stinking God. And so you, there, there's the split between what your reason informs you is true on the one hand and what you are willing to acknowledge is true 
on the other hand. And when those come into conflict, then one begins to see that it takes more than evidence. It takes more than arguments. It takes more than good reasons uh, to convince someone, if you will, to actually make the commitment to the truth of Christianity. Because all the arguments and evidence and reasons in the world are not going to solve the most fundamental of all problems. And that is, are you willing for it to be true? Because if you're not willing for it to be true, all the arguments are going to be worthless and pointless. Here's a quote from Kierkegaard's point in that passage where he talks about the leap of faith. He just sort of offhandedly says at some point that every ditch is infinitely broad to the one who does not want to leap. And the way he puts it, the exact quote is, as if it were not the dialectically passionate loathing of the leap that makes the ditch infinitely broad. The reason, the reason I can't jump over it is because I don't want to jump at all, is his point. And so he was, he was basically saying to his culture, to his time and place, and this is a timeless truth, that our problem is not, um, is not the rational, is not the rationality of our faith. That's not, a, that's not our problem. The problem is something more fundamental and deeper. It's that our passions are wrong. Is that our passions are aligned in such a way that, what's, how's he call it? We have a dialectically passionate loathing of the leap. And I think what he means by that is a, dispa- a dialectically passionate loathing of Christianity the truth of Christianity, of God, and the things of God that I would be leaping to. Okay, the third important question that I think he addresses is the question, what does true saving faith require? What is the nature and character of true saving faith? And this is where Kierkegaard is, I think, most helpful to us today because he was such a such a keen observer of his of human nature and of his time in relationship to the truth of New Testament Christianity. And there are several points here that I'm going to make in response to this, and, I, and this certainly is not exhaustive. But the first one, true saving faith is a way of life, and he calls it the religious way of life. Um, in my idiom, I wouldn't call it the religious way of life because religion for me I would identify more with the Phariseeism of the New Testament, and it, I stumbled over this for a while, but I realized that for Kierkegaard, religion is a positive thing, not a, not a negative thing. The Phariseeism, if anything, he would call the ethical way of life, but faith is the religious way of life. There are three different modes of life from his perspective. There's the aesthetic way of life, which has nothing to do with art and beauty. Uh, comes from the Greek word for the senses, Aesthetes is the, are the senses. So the aesthetic way, way of life is the life of the hedonist, the life of the person who's looking for uh, the stimulation of their senses so that their sense experience is the actual meaning of their life. Um, he, he has In his work, either or, he has just wonderful critique of the aesthetic way of life.